Well, good morning. Uh, all right, so we're going to have technical difficulties for two seconds. Uh, bear with me. We'll see what happens here. My iPad has been killing me today, um, which is funny because uh, it's not funny if you're the one about to preach from your notes and your notes disappear. You start to struggle a little bit, except uh, the Lord has apparently given me the gift of gab, and uh, this just means you're not going home to about two today. Uh, eventually, we'll get control of it here. Give me two seconds. Open your Bibles up to Romans chapter 1. We'll try to get there, and then it just shut down. Hey, you just run the slides in the back for me. Um, here we go, experiencing Christ. Um, which is, I guess this is why we're going down this road today. I wanted to come back to Romans and, and begin the process of, of getting us back up to speed because we took a break for like six months from Romans, and now we're going to get back into Romans chapter 3. Not today. Today we're going to be at chapter 1. We're going to rehash a little bit, try to get the main point of Romans, uh, the first couple of chapters, and then we'll spend the rest of the, the spring leading all the way up until Easter looking through Romans chapter 3 and hopefully uh, 4, but it'll probably be Romans chapter 3 and, and chapter 3 and, and some more chapter 3, and then Easter comes. But uh, I'm joking. I, I hope we're not in it that long, but I really don't care. I don't, I don't feel rushed to try to get through the Word of God. Uh, we get to do this for the rest of our lives. Today, what I wanted to look at was experiencing Christ. What does it mean to experience Christ? So I just want to go ahead and... and get you to brace yourselves. Probably going to make you doubt your salvation today, and that's the point. So if you're walking and you're like, man, I wonder if I'm saved, that's literally the feeling we're going after today. Now, that said, you can have assurance in Christ, and you can never doubt your salvation. But all of us, even if we are sure we're saved, will have moments where um, we doubt this. I, I love philosophy. I love studying it. I love listening to uh, whether they're atheists, angry atheists, agnostics, theists, deists, whatever. I love listening to everybody talk and, and present their ideas and their understanding. And I think it sharpens us. Now, be careful with what I'm saying here. But I think it sharpens us to learn to think. The danger for us is that, for especially American Christianity for decades, um, we think thinking is bad. Like somehow Satan made thinking. And only the, the, the evil people think. The rest of us, we just have faith. And we just put our faith in God. And that's ridiculous. Because God is the one that put the principles in the world that guide us. It is God that invented physics. It is God that invented the order of creation and how the world works. It is God that gave us a mind. It is God that created us in His image. It is God that speaks to us and communicates the gospel to us through in, into intelligence through the word the written word the spoken word through theology which theology literally means the love of the study of God or to study the Lord it is God that designed us to investigate to inquire to think through but however nothing in our lives is free from the consequences of sin Nothing is free from temptation. So in our thinking, there is a desire to, to put ourselves up on a pedestal and said, so I think, therefore I am, and I will think this way about myself. And even if it means we're going to undo what the Scripture says. Until you come into the church. And then you enter the church and we say, don't think, just believe. Here's the gospel. Make this decision. Say this prayer. Come to this Bible study or this the VBS Bible school. Uh, get saved at eight years old. And once your ticket is punched, you are good to go. It's okay if you attend church once a month. It's okay if you never read your Bible. It's okay if you never tell anybody about Jesus Christ from the day that you said you got saved to the day that you stand before Him in judgment. It's okay that all you said was a prayer. Can you show me anywhere in Scripture where that's okay? You can't find that in the Bible. The men are memorizing in our small groups the book of Philippians. So if they're new to this, this, uh, this year in the small group, first, the first chapter of Philippians is what they, they have to memorize. And Paul says, Paul and Timothy, slaves of Christ Jesus, 
to the saints who are in Ephesus or in Philippi with the elders and the deacons. Grace to you and peace from God, the, from our Lord. Now check this out. Slaves. The term there is, is doulos. And it can mean indentured servant. It can mean one who made yourself a slave. But it can also just mean a bad American word, slave. We just observed MLK Day, Monday, right? And that's the uh, freedom from oppression and trying to move America to the civil rights and understanding that regardless of your skin color, we are all people. And that is legit. And I, uh, under no circumstances do I undercut that at all. In fact, but... I will say this, the Bible has slavery in it. We are slaves of Christ Jesus. You are born slaves to sin, and then Jesus makes us slaves to Him. And it is for freedom that Christ set us free. So no, no longer return to the slavery that we had in sin. And the Gospel says, with the Gospel is this understanding that you are not just abandoned and isolated when you come to Christ and just set out into the world to live life however you want, which is strangely what we teach as a church to people. We tell them, get saved and then go live like a hellion. Because grace covers it all. You'll have parents, and I've heard this more than once in my life, and I, and, and I it grieves my heart when I hear this, but a parent will come up to me or a grandparent and say, hey, pastor, can you go and will you go talk to my son? Will you give my son a call? He needs to get back in church. He grew up, I raised him in church. He's been in church until he was in high school. Then sometime he got his license, 16, 17 years old, 18 years old. He just left the church and he hasn't been back. That boy needs to get back into church. No, that boy needs Jesus. That boy is lost. What? You can't say that. Yes, I can. From the Scripture. Had they stayed with us, they would have been of us. But the fact they're not with us means they're not of us. This is what John says when he's talking about how do you understand salvation. There is an idea of keeping, and I'm not talking church attendance makes you saved. No, not at all. In fact, it can prohibit you from salvation. What? Are you saying I am so confused, Darren? Being a good church member does not make you a good Christian. A Christian is a relationship. It's so old hat now that, that its familiarity breeds contempt. And we think, oh, I'm not in a religion, which is correct. I'm in a relationship. That's also correct. But the way we often say it is, I'm a lazy person who doesn't want to do either. I don't want to conform myself to a religious pattern of life, nor do I want to enter into a relationship in a sacrificial, loving manner. So therefore, I will neither walk in a relationship with God, nor in some pagan form of religion. What does that make you? Not saved. You're just a lazy pagan where the rest of the pagans are working forward to making themselves better in their view, which is ridiculous. You can't make yourself better. Let me introduce you to Romans chapter 7, where Paul is saying, I, I can't, I, the, the, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The things I want to do, I can't do. In fact, I was sold in slavery to sin, and the righteousness I desired to do, he says, I was unable to do that. What does that mean? Come close. Here's what this means. There's absolutely no way in your life you can make yourself better before God. Okay, that was weak sauce. Jerry said amen, my wife said yes, and the rest of you are like, wait, what? Zero. You have zero, 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 nil, none, zero ability to make yourself better before God. Zero. Try all you want, and you are just a perversion of what you were trying to achieve. The thing that is broken can never fix itself. It needs an outside agent to work on itself. That agent is the Lord. Now, where does this apply for us today? Paul says in Ro Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and also to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Next slide, please. So check this out. Is your Christianity authentic? This is where I want to go with this. The verse says, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God. The dunamis, the power of God for salvation. Later, later on you will hear some people say that's where we get our word dynamite from. Yes, it's where we get our word dynamite from, but they did not, the Greeks did not understand dynamite. That wasn't a thing. In dunamis, it just meant power. 
It's the, it's the Mwah! to achieve something. You'll hear dudes in the gym and they're just like, Mwah! why are they Mwah! as they're lifting? Because you're getting down deep. They're little girly men. No, I'm joking. They should lift harder. I'm, jo- I'm still joking. But you hear the grunt, and what the grunt is saying is I'm getting everything I can muster from my very being to push this or to lift this and do what I need to do. That, that's dunamis. That's just getting it all and bringing it. It's the power of God for salvation. What is the power of God for salvation? The gospel the euangelion. What is the euangelion? This is the good news. It's the message of victory. When a good news was given, it was often a soldier would run from the battle lines to where the, the commander was or where the, the emperor was and, and or to the people, and he would say, we won, we defeated them. And celebration would go, would begin. The gospel is a message of a completed action. All right, bear with me. What completed action? Some completed action. Some completed action that was not known if it would be completed by most people. Some completed action that was a necessity. It needed to be complete. We, were, we absolutely needed this thing to take place. And so when it is completed, it is good news that it was completed. And so we want to hear about this good news. And thus the gospel brings an announcement of, hey, this thing is done. It happened. We won. We are victorious. So this message of victory is the power of God for salvation to all who would believe. This is the heart of Romans. This is what Paul is getting at. He's looking at the Roman church. He's going, is your Christianity authentic? I've never been there. He says, you know I've tried to come and I want to come, but I keep, I, things keep happening. One day I'll get there. And he did in chains. But, but he says, I will come. But until that point, he wants to answer this question. Is your Christianity authentic? Here's what we don't know about the Roman church, how it started, where it began. It's just a bunch of people believing in the Lord. And they're like, how did that happen? And so Paul's wanting to go there and he's wanting to make sure these folks are walking with the Lord, but he can't. So he feels impressed by the Lord to send a letter. And this letter is an explanation of our need of the gospel. First, of our rebellion against God. Our need of the gospel, which we'll pick up in a couple of weeks, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We'll unpack that in a couple of weeks. And then he starts bringing us, chapter 4, he's get, bridging the gap into the gospel. Chapter 5, we start getting the gospel. And then we see the ramifications of the gospel and what it means and, and just how we can praise God constantly and walk in it. But before we get there, I want to ask this question. Is your Christianity authentic? Now, I've been reading a book here recently. I've actually been reading... Uh, two books. The fast allows you to read a lot of books, and so um, completed a few, and now I'm on to two different types of book books. One is basically addressing cultural Christianity, and the other is one that I read before. I highly recommend it. It's a marvelous book. It's called The Insanity of God. It's about uh, the suffering, persecuted church throughout the world. It's 2013, I think, is when the book was written, so it's six years old. Who has read that book, by the way? Okay. So the insanity of God is probably something you want to get and read this week. It's not heavy. I'm a slow reader, and I plow through this book just because it's biography. And I I mean, I like biographies. I don't know if you guys do as well. But it's an autobiography, and then it unpacks the suffering church. And it's opened my eyes to this idea that, hey, guys, we don't have a hard Christianity. We don't even have a hard life. No matter what you think is hard, it's not hard when you leave America. 4% of the world's population, that's America, controls 40% of the world's fund income. Fund money, discretionary income is what it's officially known as. That means every single one of us spends and purchases and indulges in life in a way that is just not known to the rest of the world. And then once you get on a plane and you touch down on another continent across the Atlantic Ocean, you realize, oh my goodness, life is different. And their form of life has them dying numerous, at numerous parts of Africa, sub 40 years. Could you imagine that your death is coming, before you, coming to you before 40 years of age? 
when your children were born with AIDS, because you were born with AIDS. When you're starving. So someone comes and preaches Jesus to you. What do you hear? Why would you repent and follow Jesus in a country where you know you're going to die and you've never seen Jesus rescue people from that starvation death, from the, <clears throat> from the AIDS death, from the violent murders where their kids haven't been rescued from the fact that these clans are coming in and abducting kids and enlisting them in the army, their army, and then turning them back on their families and having them kill the very villages they, they were in. Why would you believe in Jesus? Is it, is it because you want a prosperous life? Or do you want something that's better than this life? See, I'm not saying the rest of the world is perfect. Don't hear that from me. But what I will tell you is that their form of Christianity is often more authentic. Oh, that just insults us all. It ought to. They don't understand. They think, they think we live in heaven right now. That America is heaven on earth. But if you ask any American about what it's like to be alive, we're miserable. Why hasn't God given me this? Why don't I have this? Why don't I? I want more and more and more and more and more. Yet the rest of the world's looking at us going, man, I wish I could just be there. I watch my kids get beheaded. My husband's in prison. Being tortured. It doesn't matter. Pick Pick a continent. Pick, pick a country. Is it the Middle East? Is it Northern Africa? Is it the uh, Russian territories? Is it China? Asia? Believers are being put to death all over the world right now. I mean, they'd have to ask this question. We should ask this question. Why do you die for Christ? Why die for Christ? If you go into an Islamic territory and their children convert to Christianity, very often the family will perform an honor kill and kill the child. The child could be 25 years old, 35 years old. But very often because that family has disgraced Allah, or that individual has disgraced Allah and the family, the family will put their beloved child to death. In America, if our children come out and say, I'm homosexual, and I don't care what the Bible says, very many of us will say, you know what? I don't care either. Let's embrace our homosexuality. If you want to be a pastor, you can be a pastor. Think about it. I'm not targeting homosexuality. It's a sin like other sins. It needs to be washed under the blood of Christ, and we need to be redeemed from it. My bigger point is right now it's being pushed down our throats that, that Christians should not view homosexuality or all this gender stuff that's happening as a sin and rather we should openly embrace it. Open our arms and say, you're right, this is acceptable. If we won't tell our children the way to the truth, the way to our God, we won't die for Him. If you ask this question to a uh, uh, Middle Eastern Christian. Why do you believe in Jesus and why are you willing to die? They will almost always answer because they've experienced Christ. There's something that goes beyond a head intellectual agreement to a radical transformation of the person, of the soul, a, a gifting of hope, a gifting of a desire for the Lord. But if you ask the average Christian in America why they believe in the Lord, you might get something, well, I don't know of any better options. The thing I get most often is, well, my grandfather was a preacher. My grandmother was faithful in the church. My dad was a deacon. Let me get this right. You're a Christian because you came to a building. Does that sound like this verse? For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. If your Christianity is, I'm a Christian because I just come to church or because I grew up in, it in my family or because it seems like it's the best of all options, what happens if a better option comes available? What happens if the woman or the guy you marry or are married to decide that, you know, I don't want to be in this anymore? 
It seems oppressive. I mean, this Paul dude constantly telling people that women need to submit and men uh, love your wives. It seems like the men get off and the easy and the women have to like bow down and respect their husbands. I'm, I'm not down with this. I'm not down with the cultural or, or the, the uh, gender distinctives in Scripture. I'm not down with a God who defines my sexuality and prohibits it. I'm not down with a God who tells me that, that I need to sacrifice, take up my cross and follow Him. I'm not down with a God that requires me to spend time in prayer and on and on. And what we do is we define Christianity by do's and do nots. And then we do not. We say, I just do not like these. And so we roll on. But I'm not saying the rest of the world has got it right. What I'm saying is in a suffering area, when you listen to Christians talk about the relationship with the Lord, it's far different than what we know and experience. It's far different. When you ask them, is you, why are you a Christian? It almost always goes back to the Lord. When you ask, how is it that you were able to do 30 years in prison for the gospel? When a guard is wiping his, his uh, fecal matter on your toast, and that's your breakfast every morning for nine months, this one pastor that was in prison, for nine months every morning, a single piece of toast with refuse wiped on that toast from the guard. Eat it. This is your food. How is it you did it? And all he had to do, all he had to do was say, I, I deny Jesus. Sign his name on a paper that says I was a paid agent of the Western world against Russia. And he would have been let go. Returned back to his home because his witness would have been discredited, but under no circumstances was he going to let his witness be discredited. So scrape that off every morning and eat for nine months. And then, later on, he gets out, he starts pastoring, doing his thing again, and a woman comes to him and says, hey, I'm a believer. I'm not allowed medication for my dying son. Would you bring some medication? And uh, prohibited in the country from giving medication to Christians. Would you come and pray over my diabetic son? And he walks in the room. And that's the guard that put his dung on his bread every morning for nine months. And he's now praying over that guy. Me personally, if I saw the guy in a weakened position, I'd probably strangle him. You wouldn't? You'd be okay that every morning while you were starving, while your family was going without, while you were freezing in a cold gulag, you got fed some guy's refuse every morning for nine months, and you think you're just going to want to pray over that guy? Guys, we have people in this church, and in my last church, that will not worship with another person because they disagreed with each other. Is your Christianity authentic? You know, the I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes is demonstrated when you're literally praying over your enemies. When for 10 years you are starving and you've seen your family, your family was allowed to visit you three times. When your children are banned from school in Russia and in the Ukraine. When in the early 90s, late 80s, and, and 70s as well, when pastors were arrested, their children were prohibited from graduating from college. They would be given it's socialism, so they'd be given, or communism, they'd be given the most menial of tasks, barely paid so that the family was starving in an attempt to discredit the father and Jesus and cause an entire generation. Their goal was if we could get the children to turn on their parents, then Christianity dies in our country in a single generation. And so they made it hard. How would you continue to serve the Lord during this time? Only if the gospel, the power of God for salvation occurred in us. And what I fear in our church more than anything else is that many of us have not experienced the power of God unto salvation. 
what we've done is we've fallen into a cultural Christianity, the second book I'm reading, that is just highlighting stat after stat after stat, almost going so far as to say less than 7% of America might actually be Christian. How can you say that? Because what we are is cultural. We are better Baptists than we are Christ followers. There are things we do and don't do that we have no earthly idea if they're even in the Bible. We just do it because it's always been done this way. And we don't care. We sing songs that we have no business singing. These songs do not glorify God in the least, but they're heritage for us. Or their new culture. Always wanting to write a new song to the Lord. But if you're singing to yourself, you're not singing to the Lord. Like you just got to track some of this stuff. Which direction is the praise going? Horizontal towards me? Vertical towards the Lord? We don't gather and pray. You have 200 people in church. And there will be 8 people in the prayer room on Sunday morning. Well, Sunday's my day. Mm. Mm. I think you missed it. There, we don't believe in the Sabbath. You're right. Jesus is the Lord of every day. The Old Testament requirement where Jesus took it. Well, it's for freedom that Christ set us free. Yeah, so do not submit yourselves to a a yoke of slavery, he goes on and says. Same, Same verse. Like comma, he finishes it. Finishes the sentence. Our form of Christianity is not very Christian. Almost every time I preach a message like this, people leave and I get hate mail. Or, that would be nice if I at least got the hate mail. At least I would know what would happen. But normally, it it filters its way through four or five different people over a course of six months. Darren, they left because you made them doubt their salvation. Paul says, examine yourselves to see if you are in Christ. I'm taking it from the pages of the Bible, y'all. It is a foolish thing for me to stand up and preach over you every single week. And not cause you, and not call you to evaluate where you are with the Lord. Paul did not take this for granted with the Romans, and Paul was inspired by God to write this. You should never take your salvation for granted. The question, is your Christianity authentic, has an answer. There is no gray area. It is absolutely yes or absolutely no. If you're like, I I think so, no. That's where that goes. What? It seems so hard. I don't know of a third option between heaven and hell. Do you? Like, there's no like middle ground. Well, the Catholics believe in purgatory. They made that junk up. Literally made it up along with so much of what other, other stuff they believe in. That don't even get me started. Why'd you guys bring that up? I don't need to be talking about that. Here's the deal. I'm so trained right now. Next slide. <laughs> for, for Paul, Christianity meant being saved by God, experiencing the power of God, and knowing God. That's how we test our Christianity. I'm saved by God. I've experienced the power of God, and I know God. Now, let's ask this question again. Is this your Christianity? What? Christianity is not a thing to where you're like, well, I said this magic prayer junk as a kid. And I'm not denying that you can't say a prayer as a kid and get saved. I'm just calling it junk if you believe that's what saved you and not the God who heard that prayer. If you think my my ritual saved me, I went down to the front. It's why purposely, I get beat up for this all the time, but it's why purposely I do not do an invitation in this church the way you're used to the Baptist invitation. One, we can see where Billy Graham invented that, basically. There's a few guys behind him. But no, you can't track that through the history of the church. You can track that through the last hundred years in America. To where I would say, uh, stand up, uh, we're going to sing a song, and come, come now, be saved. I'm not knocking Billy Graham. He had to do it. He went into lost environments, began preaching in the middle of a city. And how else are you going to find out if someone gave their life to Jesus Christ? It literally makes sense. Come now and tell me because I don't know who you are. I'm looking at 30,000 people. How do we we assimilate this person in the body of Christ? That I don't have an issue with. 
every Sunday in the church. Say a magic prayer. Let's get baptized. You're good. Go get drunk, young man. Give yourself over to college life, even if you don't go to college. Live like an absolute demon, and God's got you. You're good. If that's our attitude, if we can so flippantly run into sin, you have to challenge if you even saw Jesus Christ. Because when my wife married me, I sure didn't run to the arms of another woman. Well, Darren, that's not fair. You're right, that's too bad of a, that's too low of an example. The Holy God invites us into a relationship with Him and says, come, open the door and I'm going to dine with you. Our fellowship will never come to an end. And we're like, ah, I mean, I'm sort of with you on that, Jesus, except to the point where we're like, this never come to an end thing. Do you, do you know how fun my life was before to you? Like I had all of this other stuff. Can I go back to that on Friday and Saturday? Every country song. Get drunk on Friday and Saturday. Go to church on Sunday. Cuss on Monday. Oh my goodness. Chill bumps. That is so amazing. I just feel the warmth of Christianity in the South. I feel blasphemy, but okay. I'm sure Jesus is like, oh, Father, look at my nails and, and the, the holes in my hands. Look, look at the, the scar in my side where they pushed the, the crown down on my head, where they hammered me into the cross, where they spat upon me, where they punched me, where they pulled the beard from, beard from my face and, and killed me. I totally did that so that they would just spend an hour with me on Sunday morning. Maybe too, if they're super Christian, for Sunday school. And that is my, oh, I died for that. I don't care that they don't know who I am. I don't care that they never talk to me throughout the week. I don't care that they don't know my voice. It's Friday. It's cake stands. It's Saturday. It's college football. It's beer and broth, baby. It's Sunday. Pastor, get over. Like, there's a football game next week, homies. So like, what, six, seven o'clock at night? We're good. I can make it to that. I mean, you've been here on the first of the year where we preach for like, I preach for like seven hours. Trust me, I got a good solid 530 in me right now, with or without notes. Some of you are like, he is absolutely serious. You have picked up what I'm laying down then. We're just going to preach till we all just give it up and come to Jesus. Some people are like, oh my, what happened today? <laughs> no, no football, no sports I really care about, and nowhere to be today, and fasting. I'm miserable. <laughs> Good, I'm joking. Um, <clears throat> so check this out. What God calls us into is not your give Jesus his shout out as you hit a home run. It's not, oh, God, bless their heart. No, it's not the country of the southern cuss words. That's not what Jesus calls us into. It's not learning how to be rude, but have a Christian flavor on it. It's not learning to live our life, but having a blessing over our door and re not even regarding the God of that blessing. What Christianity is, is a marriage. And so, therefore, there is a saving aspect of that marriage. What's that saving aspect? That we were redeemed by God. Literally purchased back from death. Romans 5.8 But God proves His own love for us that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. So, the first part, He saves us. He pulls us back to Him. We were lost, abandoned, arrogant, proud, prodigal, rebellious kids. And God saved us while we were in this. But he's, what does He save us into? He saves us into His presence. And this is what it means to experience God. Guys, I can't, I can't do a lot with this. It, it's like air. You either breathe it or you don't. Experiencing God is you either are experiencing Him, or you're not. If you're asking me to define it for you, that's sort of like defining air. In fact, that might actually be easier than defining experiencing God's presence. I hear people all the time say, 
I read the Bible and I don't get anything from it. I pray and I don't get anything from it. Now, there are some some things that I could put in there and say, okay, let me challenge you. If you're a Christian and you're reading and praying, you don't feel like you're getting anything from it, then maybe it's because you're distracted. Is the phone in your hand? Is the TV on? Are the kids walking around upstairs? Are you trying to carry on a conversation? Are you listening to music? Are you feeling rushed as you try to get through this time so that you got your Jesus done, but now you go back to the rest of your life? I promise you, you're not going to get anything from it because you're not really dialed in. If you do that with your best friend, you're like, tell me about what, what just captivates your heart. And the moment they start talking to you, because I'm sort of like this occasion, um, you pick up the guitar and you start playing dueling banjos by yourself. You're going to figure it out. You can't, by the way. You can't play two, band, two instruments at the same time. You're so distracted that you're not even listening to what that person is saying. There's been more than once in my life where Beth is like, are you listening to me? What? That just answered the question? I didn't even hear, are you listening to me? I just heard, wah, 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 wah. Crap, she's talking to me. What? It's like, where were you at? You're four feet from me. Guys, if that happens in a normal relationship, do you think it's not going to happen when you open the word, sit down, try to read and pray? Of course it's going to happen. If you are doing anything else while you're trying to spend time with the Lord, you're not going to, to pay attention enough. You won't hear, I hate this phrase, but I'm going to use it, the still small voice of the Lord. You find that nowhere in Scripture, but anyways. They're quoting Elijah, or when God comes to Elijah in the calm and the small of the wind. That's not really a proper application, but anyways. So the point is, when God speaks, it's not usually through a shout. If he did, we would probably die of terror. Anytime he's like, hey, what's up? In the Bible, people are like flat on their face. Don't kill me. So if God just like appeared to you and was like, pushed you in the shoulder, hey man, how you doing? Stroke right there. Just you code black. You're done. Like hopefully you had the meds on speed dial. If that's what you're expecting during your quiet time, go ahead and have your thumb on the red button as you get ready to hit dial 911 so that when you clinch, they're on their way to maybe resuscitate you. But what typically happens is the word just starts to make sense in our head and we, we feel conviction and we feel inspired and thoughts that, that illuminated, that, that begin to, to change how we think. And then we pray to the Lord about those things and you get up and you're like, wow. I mean, I was just reading and I was talking to the paint, but I feel much different because you're not just reading and you're not just talking to the paint. You're talking to the living God. And the living God is talking to you through his word. But I cannot go into any more detail about experiencing God than just that. You have to do it. Well, how do I do it? If you're hunting the experience, you're not going to get it. Listen to me. If you're hunting the experience, you're not going to get it. But if you're seeking the Lord, you will find him for he has promised that to you. If you seek the Lord with all of your heart, what does that mean? Guys, go all in. Seek to know God. Read the scripture and say, Lord, I want to know you. I know I don't have a right to know you, but you have purchased that right for me. You have saved me. We go back to point number one. Because you've saved me, I will experience your presence. I will draw close to you because you said if I draw close to you, you will draw close to me. You told me that if I seek you, I will find you. You will let yourself be found. And I can't prove it any more than that. Because at the end of the day, what keeps people in prison and bearing up under torture and watching their families murdered in front of them is not a head knowledge of God, but a personal relationship with God that overrides all other personal relationships. I can say this absolutely. There is no way you could keep me from dying for my children. If I had to go through the worst of all situations and hope to keep them alive, there is nothing you could do to keep me from it. And you guys are all the same way. 
it, it makes good songs. I would cross the ocean for you or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever. We're not talking about that stuff. We're talking about literally we would die for the ones we love and only the ones we love. Everyone else, we'd probably have to be tricked into it. But for our families, we would die for them. That's the type of relationship you have with God if it's a relationship you have with God. Darren, why would you die for your family? Because they're mine? Like, I'm not going to be able to flesh that out for you more. Well, um, their life matters more than another person's life. Not really, but to me it does. But they're just a person like everybody else is a person. Well, they're better looking. I think so, but, but you would disagree with me about your kids. And that's legit. That's fine. We should all have rose-colored glasses on when we look at our family to a point. Like, well, they're, they're going to cure cancer. Probably not my kids, but um, <laughs> I'm joking. I hope you do. Um, but, the, but the reality is, if you think about it, they're not special for what they do. They're special for who they are. They're my kids. They're my kids. What about Beth? She's my love. She's special because of who she is to me. So why would you die for God? Because He's special for who He is to you. You've experienced Him. Guys, I'm not dying for President Trump or whoever comes after him. Why? I don't know him. He can let him die for himself. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not joking. I'm not saying it's hard. I don't know him. I have no relationship with him. The governor of our state don't even know his name. Couldn't pick him out of a lineup of two. Couldn't. Put his name on a piece of paper and tell me that's the governor. I'm like, okay. Darren, your head's in this hole. Mm -hmm, a little bit. I brought this out to Alex today. We were talking. I said, you ask me anything about world history from like 4,000 years ago. And baby, I got it. Ask me what's happening, on, going on right now in our nation. I'm like, I don't know. Give me a map and say, pick countries out. You could give me the name Rouge, and I would think that's a country. All right, let's put that down. Which one of the maps looks like it's sort of red? That's the state, that's the country of Rouge. I'm not even kidding, I'd fail a geography test right now. Are you smarter than a fifth grader? Math? Yes. Everything else? No. Just absolutely confident in that. Can you read? Sometimes. I'm not dying for any of these people. I'm not dying for any of these things. I'm not, you're not going to see me get into argument over why Pittsburgh Steelers football is better than Ohio football. I mean, we know it is, but it is. But I'm not going to argue about it. That's your bad. You just got to accept that. Cleveland stinks. But that said, am I going to divide a friendship over that? No. No, not at all. I mean, I won't drink from your cup or ride in your car, but we can still be friends. But what about your relationship with Christ? Will you divide over that? See, because most of us haven't experienced God. No, no, we won't divide over it. What the American church wants more than anything else is a unity, even if that unity is achieved through sin and towards sinful goals. We just don't want our people to leave. You've got the wrong motivation. The motivation is we want to take people to Christ. And Jesus came to force us to make a decision. In fact, he says what he'll do to us will cause families to tear apart. He will turn children against their parents and parents against their children. You're like, hold up, that doesn't sound very godly. Well, God said it, so therefore it's godly. What he's saying is, when it comes to him, there is no one else that matters except him. And I'm afraid, guys, that what we have is a cultural Christianity and not the power of gospel and for salvation. I think what we have more than anything else and what I've seen in New Hope Baptist Church it's a very confusing Christianity to everybody else. I'm teeing off on, on us a little bit, myself included. The Lord, let me have a moment of transparency before I absolutely hit you with a hook. Because it's going to feel like bad. But here we go. This week, the Lord has allowed me to see several of the idols of my heart. Several of the things I live for. And it's appalling. It's appalling to know that I stand up and I preach Jesus every week. 
but what I care about is my collection of stuff that rusts, that burns, that gets taken. That I'd rather put money into my image, put time and effort into feeling better physically, looking better physically, and not so much about the glory of God. So one of the things this year with Who's Your One is, firstly, I'm feeling convicted to try to highlight Jesus more. What that means is we're going to have to tell people about Jesus, but it also means you need to get saved. That's exactly what that means. There's the, there's the hook. This pathetic Christianity that we walk in is not Christianity but paganism. We beat up the Catholics all the time for their practices and their rituals and all the stuff that they do that has nothing to do with the gospel, that actually muddies the gospel and confuses the way to Jesus Christ. And the truth is we do the same thing. We expect people to dress a certain way before they come to church, act a certain way, talk a certain way, live a certain way. And then once they've done all that, that's what Christianity is. Travel outside North Carolina for 15 minutes and realize Christianity looks different the further you get away from the South the further you get away from America, the further you get away from the Americas, it starts to look very, very different. And then what we do is we tend to fight these cultural distinctives and we say, no, 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 no. I don't want you to look like that. I want you to look like me. And instead of preaching the gospel, we preach my preferences. And the reality is most of us are probably saved through preferences. If, if we asked, Truthfully, when's the last time you've experienced the presence of God where God spoke to you through His Word, drew you in, and proved to you that you're His child? Would we all be able to say today, yesterday, this week? Or would we start going, man, I don't know if I've ever heard the voice of God. If we have heard the voice of God, are we rejecting Him? I'm not thinking you guys are lost in here. I know that sounds like that. You, you might be. If, if you are, let's fix that. Well, how do I fix that? Say yes to Jesus in a relationship with him. Not, not a magic prayer. Not a, I said this and now I'm good. No, no, no. Enter into a relationship. Seek to know who God is. He, he's the one that gives us that desire. We love God because God first loved us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So we say, Jesus, I know I can't do anything to, embrace, to, to deserve your love or to acquire forgiveness for myself, but you promised it to me. And so, Lord, I want the life that you, live, that you promised me. And then, like Paul, the life I live, I now live for Christ. And what are we doing? The life I live, I now live for Christ. That for is a huge word right there. Not, I live because of Christ. Not, I live outside of Christ. I live for Christ. What, what am I saying? I pursue Christ. That's what it means to live for something. Most of us live for either our spouses or our families. Some people live for their money and their possessions. Other people live for their fame and their self-advancement. And all of those will take you to hell. Your family, though they are good, are not really good. The heart is wicked and deceitful above all else. They too have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So putting them first is called an idol. And in Southern Baptist life, that's our number one idol. Sort of. Until it comes time to telling people about Jesus, then we're like, let somebody else tell our kids about Jesus. You can't twist my arm hard enough for me to serve in children's church. Just identify the manipulative ploy I just used there and respond appropriately by volunteering for children's church. I've never understood this in the South. We love our families in the Southern Baptist Church. We love our families. Just not enough to tell them about Jesus when we're all gathered together. I mean, we won't come to church because of a ball game, because of a sporting event or an activity or whatever. But when we are at church, I don't love them enough to go back there and tell our kids about Jesus. Somebody reconcile that for me because I can't level that equation. I can't figure out what to do with that. I love my kids just not enough to tell them about the God who created them. 
but I'll teach him how to throw a 12-6 changeup. Put that perfect spiral on a football. Here's how, you, here's how you bend it like Beckham on a soccer ball. Let's play some tennis. <clears throat> some golf. Get it figured out. What about your walk with the Lord? Huh? He'll get it figured out. Uh, no, they won't. Guys, while this sounds like a meandering sermon, it's not. It's, it's a passionate plea to say, please open your eyes. For Jesus is coming soon. And if he doesn't, your death is coming sooner. It's, it's a scary thing. My mortality just got attached to me this week as I had a doctor's appointment. And the doctor tells me I have 50% blockages in my arteries. I'm 38 years old. What do you mean I have 50% blockage in my arteries? How many cheeseburgers have I eaten? Apparently, all of them is the answer. And I'm laughing about it, but I'm trying to fix my diet and work out like a madman and, and say, dude, I don't want to punch my ticket at 48. I mean, do the math. I'm not a smart guy, but do the math here. If, if 50% blockage is at 38, at 76, I should have at least 100% blockage. But how long have I had 50% blockage? And does blockage actually work like that? Or does it compound once it started to block? I'm going to go ahead and say I think it compounds. That's my nerd coming out. Just track with me for a second. So if you went with life expectancy, I'm thinking, hmm, 20 years? Unless something changes? Also, my family has a history of heart attacks in their 50s. So you're like, oh, I might need to adjust something. Or I could just be a moron and go get some Wendy's triple cheeseburgers right now. Many of us are like, Christ is coming back. He saves us. He wants us to know Him. Want a Netflix tonight? What? Where did that come from in the equation? Like, who brought that variable in there? And that's us. Darren, will you hurry up and get done so I can eat? Yes, at five. I told you. We already covered this. Now I'm going to let you out in, in under nine minutes. 12.30 today. Might let you out in the next 60 seconds. But here's the deal. Have you experienced the power of God in your life for salvation? That's my question. Have you experienced God's power bringing us to salvation? I'm not going to put the experience above all else and say unless you've had this magical moment in your life, you're not saved. That's not what I'm saying. I have all kinds of points on here that we'll pick up later on how you can prove your salvation in the Lord, what the Scripture says. But guys, let's, let's start with this one. Is there a desire for Christ in your heart that wasn't there at some point in your life? That's proof God's working in your life. Is there a desire for the Lord that wasn't there before? I can remember not having a desire for the Lord, and then I can remember having a desire for the Lord. Where did that come from? Did I just wake up one day and be like, I love the Lord. I'm going to make myself do it. No. The gospel was preached to me, and in the gospel was the revelation that God says, I love you. And my heart said, I love you back. Now, it's pathetic as all get out. I'm as baby as they come sometimes, and so are you. We're trivial. We're given up to whining and crying for the things we want. I'm offended. You should be. But that said, um, think about how we live our lives. It's what next great thing we can have. Very rarely are we like, I've, I've counted everything as garbage for Jesus Christ. Again, men, you're going to memorize that in chapter 3 of, of Philippians where he says, I counted all refuse. I counted all garbage. Everything is junk compared to Jesus Christ. And I've set it all aside that I might have more of Him and be found in Him not having a righteousness of my own that comes through works, but a righteousness that comes through faith. And he says, that's why I've given up everything in my life. Because Jesus has given me way more than I could ever have in this life. And that is not what probably any of us could say in here. We would say, yes, Jesus has given me so much. But if we said, did we count everything else as garbage? We'd say, not so much. We collect that garbage and that refuse. 
Charles said in Sunday school today that he was listening to David Platt preach and how David Platt said that he's obsessed with his 401k. If I heard that right, or was Charles saying you were obsessed with your 401k? Okay, David, the, the saint of David Platt, not obsessed with his 401k. Charles is obsessed with his 401k. I get it. Mine's a negative 401k, so I can't obsess over what I don't have. But when I listen to people and they're like, ah, oh, my 401k, of course it is. Why? Because that's your nest egg. It's, it's your golden little parachute. That's how you're going to live. I mean, because God surely won't provide for us. I'll just have to work all my life and put a 401k up. I don't have time to serve him. I don't have time to go here. Charles is not saying that. I'm not teeing off on Charles. I'm just teeing off on us with our 401ks, our, our IRAs and whatever else we have that we live for. Why? Because we don't trust God. I'm not saying forego all that. The Bible says he who saves is wise. Like, no, that's not, I'm not saying throw that stuff away. What I'm saying is what do you live for? For some of it's, it's sex and relationships. For other people, it's, especially for young people, I want Jesus to come back just not until I get married. I can read in between the lines on that one, so can every other adult. You put your honeymoon above Jesus. For everybody else, it's like, oh, pastor, I will come and I will serve in the church, but, 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 but first, I got to either retire or I got to get promotion, and so you put your job above Jesus. Look, I will love to serve the Lord, but I don't want my friends to think I'm a bigot or judgmental. So you put your image above Jesus. Oh, I'd love to be in church and worship with the, Christ, with the church. And I know that, that God says, do not forsake the assembling or the gathering of the believers. But, but can I just say one word? Beach. Or maybe another word, mountains. And that's what takes my attention on, on, from Sunday mornings. Or may I say family. we got to be where the family is. And so we bail on being a part of the body of Christ. We don't show up. We don't serve. We don't tell people about Jesus. And what are we saying is my recreation, my personal pleasure outweighs Jesus. If that's the truth, is Jesus truly Lord of your life? If he's number two, is he Lord? Like, again, I told you, here's, it's the hook. Gut punch. We all like to say, mm, I love Jesus. And here's really my goal right now. I'm trying to talk you out of your salvation. So you examine the thing you call salvation and make sure it's really salvation. I don't want to create needless doubt, but darn it, I want to create some doubt. To where you start looking back and saying, is what I believe and how I live, is that the example Christ gave to me? Or am I doing something that's not biblical? And if I'm doing something, if my Christianity is not biblical, then it doesn't save. Only the gospel saves. For the gospel is the power of God for salvation. Therefore, all other non-gospels are not the power of God for salvation. They're the power of judgment in your life. They're what brings judgment. Does that make sense? I need some head nod. I need some affirmation here. Feeling like I'm on an island right now. You guys tracking with me here? This is what we're about. We are not about coming in and singing songs. We're not about listening. Well, the praise team nailed it today. Whew, I didn't think they would. That was great. Or the praise team messed it up. When are we going to finally get a good praise team on a Sunday? Or, man, that preacher. Oh, my goodness. Will he ever just shut up? I've never heard anybody that likes his voice more than that dude. I knew there were some of you. It's a Jedi mind trick right there. Some of you are like, can we just go home? This is our once a month church day. He's dragging it out. This gives us credit for two. Again, I knew there were some of you. Guys, that's ridiculous. We should be about Enjoying the presence of Christ more than anything else. How do I enjoy His presence? How do I experience the power of God? By knowing God. Get into the Word. Ask the Lord, God, can you show me yourself? My common, my most common prayer used to be from Psalms 24, 4, um, which said, uh, test me and I want to have uh, clean hands and pure heart. 
And another way of interpreting that is I want skilled hands and a pure heart. Pure heart. That used to be my, or a heart of integrity. Skilled hands and a heart of integrity. That used to be my most common prayer. Lord, I want to do what I'm supposed to do well, and I want to have a heart of integrity. But now my most common prayer is, God, I don't deserve what I'm about to ask, but I would like to know more of you. Would you please show me yourself in Scripture? Would you woo, I use this all the time, woo my heart to you because everything else is wooing it away from me. And every time I read this Scripture and I ask that of the Lord, the Lord just brings me into His presence through the knowledge of Him. Look, salvation opens the door for us to experience the power of God through the knowledge of God. There's Christianity. It's a people consumed with knowing their God and saved in such a way by their God so they can know their God. God condescends down to us. And if I may just take some more of your time. He says this. Just go to Galatians because it's amazing. I say then, 516, I say then, walk by the Spirit, and you will certainly not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is against the Spirit, and the Spirit desires what is against the flesh. These are opposed to each other, so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Guys, Christianity is not about not failing. It's about walking with the Spirit. It's about enjoying what God has given to us. So, Here's where we wind this up today. Is your Christianity authentic? If it's not, address it before the Lord. Ask the Lord to forgive you, to save you, to draw you in, and then live your life in pursuit of Him. If that's what you need to do, um, there's a little note card in the back of your seats, man. I'd love you to tell, tell me that you are giving your life to Jesus, that you're trying to come into a relationship with Him, that you don't know what all this is about, and you'd love to sit down, and I would gladly take like six hours of your day and walk you through the gospel more thoroughly. I, I mean, seriously, I would gladly. I'll come chase you down at your house if you ask me to do so. Um, but if not, guys, this year's, man, I want to say so much more, but let me just wind it. We're trying to tell other people about Jesus Christ. Do you know that Jesus? We're trying to invite people to come to know Jesus Christ. Do you know that Jesus? Seek Him. Lord, we thank You for all that You did. Jesus, I thank You that You died on the cross and took away the penalty of our sins. I thank You that You freely give us Your righteousness to all who would come to You. Lord, I thank You that we don't have to invent our coming to You, but rather You stand at the door and You knock and You say, come, come with me. Lord, You invited us into that relationship. So I ask right now, if anyone is in here, that you would motivate them to say, Jesus, I want to be in a relationship with you. But if they're not, that they would respond by entering into that life-saving relationship you give. For the rest of us, Lord, I ask that you would help us to, to seek to experience you and to know you. Lord, the pressure and the weight of ministry on, on me and on us causes us to, to take shortcuts and to try to give a good presentation of, of exciting services and encouraging, uplifting junk. But Lord, the reality is that the gospel is already uplifting. We don't need to make it better. It is better. It is best already. It is all that it can be. And the good news is that you saved us. You died in our place. And it's a past tense thing. What you give to us is permanent. You seal us with the Holy Spirit. So Lord, I ask for those that, of us that have been sealed with the Spirit that we would walk in a manner worthy of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. That we would not put our minds on the fleshly things, but rather or the physical, humanly things, but rather our minds would be eternally focused upon You and knowing You and hunger and thirsting to see You and to experience You and that we would do so with each other. That every time we got together, Lord, that it would be nothing but us trying to pray and praise and share the Word of, I saw this from the Lord. Here's what the Scripture says about the Lord. Let's pray. Let's glorify God. Let's give testimony to who You are. Lord, I ask that You would change new hope and make us not about self-promotion,
self-promotion or growth or us for and no more or secluding ourselves from the world, but rather, Lord, you would make us a people that shine bright by constantly extolling your name and exalting you. For you, Jesus, are worthy of all praise and admiration. We've spent too long, forgive us, we have spent too long talking about our ideas and ourselves and what we want, what we think Christianity is. That was never up to us. You defined it. Christianity is the news that you saved a lost people. You ransomed us back from sin. Jesus, we praise you for that. You are the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing in New Hope. Thank you for hard messages to where we read the Scripture and it convicts the fire out of us. That is what happened this week in Galatians and Romans. Lord, I thank you that when we do put our hope in humanly things, you have a way of calling us out of that. Lord, I thank you that as we are but infants, you mature us, you raise us up. Lord, thank you for your protection. Thank you for your love. Thank you for the hope that we're going to see you face to face one day and weep at your feet. That, that turns a lot of people sideways when we think about that, but I, I want to cry every time I see family that I've been separated from. Tears of joy, not tears of misery, just tears that the heart beats and says, oh, I love you. And they, Lord, we're going to cry those tears before you because we finally see what we've longed for all the days of our life. Lord, let us live in the expectation of your return. Come, Lord. And until you do come, keep working in us for your glory and our good. Through your holy name we pray. Amen. Love you guys.